And the world is a Dungeons and Dragons place. Everywhere and everything has spirits and entities, angels and demons, and we sometimes sing in tongues. And you think you're speaking in the tongues of angels. Wow. We had powers. Hey guys, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you're only listening and you want to see our faces, go to my YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like and subscribe and leave all the love or all of your corrections. I'm always down to be corrected in the comments. If you have any criticisms at all, do not take them out on the host. Take them out on me, please. <laughs> I appreciate that. I do my best and we are speaking off camera. I don't always get it right when it comes to all of the nuances of whether it be Christianity or other religions. And I'm 100% willing to say that I'm not the expert on those. I can only speak from my own experiences. Some will even say Mormonism is not Christianity, which I can understand. But letting people know that as far as Mormons are concerned, they are a Christian church. There is a lot of perspective there and a lot of different opinions on that. I'm just trying to give people a platform to tell their stories. And that's really what we do here at Cults to Consciousness. So thank you, Derek, for that. Yeah, no problem. Today's guest has his own channel called Myth Vision, where he discusses history and stories and mythology and specifically dives into the Bible. There's so much interesting content over there, guys. I feel like I could just spend days binging all of it because it's so informational and interesting. So definitely after you watch this video, go check it out. Subscribe. Subscribe. And yeah, I'm so excited to talk with our guest today because he went from almost a pastor to basically a self proclaimed heretic. And we're going to discuss how he was raised and how he got to where he is now. So thank you so much for joining us, Derek. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I really appreciate it. I hope my story is uh, encouraging, enlightening. So I was in various denominations. I would say uh, Baptist. I was in non-denominational ones that were kind of like Pentecostal without the conservative, you need to wear a, a dress to your ankles kind of uh, background. We Different versions, different flavors. And it's kind of interesting. We opened up already creating a defense for our Mormons called Christians. And I would say yes. <laughs> Back when I was a Christian, no. Uh, today, mm. I would say yes. In fact, any I'll give anyone who wants to identify in the Christian sect or in that family that that title, because as early as you go back historically, Christians were calling other Christians not Christians. So you know, this is an age-old problem within Christianity that has gone on. But I I was Baptist. I was. Uh, in the non-denominational, we, we even had what the spirit-filled kind of movement where people spoke in tongues and cast out demons, and we would lay on hands praying for each other. We believed in healing, that people could be actually healed of diseases or, or, or demons would leave the bodies and things like that. That was the kind of Christianity that I began in a very young age getting involved into, a home church. If you want, I can start diving into it if you if you want to hear more. Yeah, I definitely want to start there. I think first before we do that, I want to provide a little bit of a disclaimer to our viewers here that we are not saying Christianity itself is a cult. And even the word cult is a little fluid as we've kind of dissected throughout these episodes. What I aim to do with this channel is call out any group that is high coercive, high control, takes away your individuality, your freedom, your ability to make your own choices. That includes coerc coercion. <laughs> Even if you say, well, I decided to do this, were you coerced into believing that way because of a certain theology or a doctrine or singular person telling you to do that? Any group that is requiring your money, trying to advance monetarily, I think those are the ones that are a little bit destructive. Not to say if you want to identify a certain way, pray to Jesus or to God and that works for you, that's beautiful and we are not demonizing you for that. I just want to explore all different types of groups and churches that may be a little bit culty in the way that they go about things. So that's what we're here to explore today. And then also 
at the end of this, when we get into the consciousness part, which in my opinion is becoming aware of who you are, becoming aware of your surroundings and maybe aware that you are being a little bit controlled, how to get out of that and how to form new perceptions and opinions based on your past. And I think we've talked off camera about this, so I'm excited to talk about it more, how his spiritual experiences look to him now through his new lens. So a very long disclaimer, but an important one. Yeah. And I think the disclaimer is a good warning up front because I think there are different degrees in which one might categorize something cult. And when we're using that term, and I imagine the title of your YouTube channel, Cult to Consciousness, is more in that high control group that might fit the bite model that a lot of the mm. um, you know academics and scholars who say this is really not a very good kind of group to involve yourself. There are various gradations between cult used in that term and a cult simply being a group of people who have a common practice or belief or something, and that's not in the derogatory use. So there's actually multiple definitions. Sometimes they overlap, of course, mm -hmm. um, but you know there there are variations on how controlling the groups are. And when I started, I wouldn't say that they were officially that kind of controlling that you had to probably experience. But there is, in a sense, I like to consider it like a mind prison mm -hmm. because the beliefs themselves start to shackle what you do or don't do, and how you behave, and how you feel about yourself in such a way they might as well be there you know telling you don't do this do this don't do this do this so there's like it's hard it's very difficult to pin this down and i'm not here to bash people who believe i if i spoke to myself 12 years ago how would i have treated myself would i be here trying to do that or would i understand that i'm in a process of trying to learn and this is my life i have to take things in as they come. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay too, to morph and change and understand new information, take it in, change your belief a little bit. That's okay and that's normal. I know a lot of people will say, no, you need to hold fast in your beliefs. But I feel like that can really hinder us quite a bit, especially as a humanity who needs to grow and evolve yeah. the harmful things that we've continued simply because they're tradition, not because they're what's best for humanity. So with that being said, let's dive into your childhood and the ways that you feel you were in some sort of culty mentality or culty group. I have some of the best parents that you can ask for. Uh, my mom is a warrior. I mean, she she was our coach growing up. She practically raised us, my dad being a military guy and never really that active with us. He was always being deployed into some other country, uh, mostly South of America before 9-11 happened. And uh, he would go down there. He had to learn Spanish. He was in seventh group. And he was Catholic. He was a Catholic. He had been to church like three times in like 21 <laughs> years. And each time was because one of his friends were getting married. So it wasn't <laughs> like he really, I mean, he may have popped in for like a Christmas Eve little, you know, mass and that's about it, but never really gave too much conscious drive into the religion. But you start talking about the Pope, dad comes around the corner going, hey, hey, you know, and so you got to be. You gotta be mindful, like there's a subconscious level in which this, he is Catholic. My yeah. mother was raised Pentecostal, very holiness, uh, speaking in tongues, that kind of upbringing. And she was very religious, coming from a poor background. So they met at a party with alcohol. And they had me and my brother, my dad is finally in the military. Um, and there, I have two older sisters by my mom's side. Long story short, dad was alcoholic, didn't know that he was alcoholic. I need to put this into the story while we're diving into my cult experience because there's a lot of emotion along the way that I really need to paint a picture mm. of. And mom would take us to church when we're really, really little. We'd have to hear this guy who was boring, <laughs> just so boring, talk about things we did not care about. So we would fall asleep on mom's lap in the big area where all the people were, or we would go where all the kids were and we'd hear him tell us stories about this man who had this boat he built and he had all these, these cool animals that all came <laughs> up onto this big boat. 
and we were like, I had memories and there's certain images that I remember being a kid. And then we'd go outside and play. That was the best part. We go out, play soccer, play baseball, play tag. That was the, that was the part that was the most enjoyable years go by. You know, it's so boring. We'd beg mom. I don't want to go mom. And she'd go, I'll take you to a golden corral buffet if you come with us. And hey. I'm an eater. So mom, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mom would like lure me in with food. And I'd go, but I never had like a conscious depth to my belief. I would be what you would say almost a subconscious Christian. I, by practice, by, by environment, by mom and mom would cry in church or something. It would touch me. And there was a moment when I was really, really young, we went to this place we call the flea market where they sell little like people would have like tables set up and they'd sell you anything they bought from China or a little like <laughs> almost like a, a yard sale kind of situation. And this guy was like talking to my mom, convinced her that he had died and come back and he could tell her about her life, like just for a few bucks and he'd give her a crystal. And I'm a little kid and I'm watching my mom and something didn't sit well with me. Mm. And mom starts crying after he says like a few sentences about mom. Mom starts crying and it scared me. It really, really scared me as a little kid because I am watching mom. I don't, I'm thinking this guy's really able to do these things. And mom's 100% hook, line, and sinker, like swallows everything he's saying there. And uh, it was a scary place because she's the only protector now that dad's overseas. And we come home, mom would tell us about old man Haggard, this demon that used to visit her every night when she was a little kid. I won't go into my mom's story too much, but I'll just say my mom had to experience extreme trauma with her alcoholic father. It was abusive in several ways. And there were all sorts of struggles that she had to deal with in her life. So she would tell us about this childhood demon named old man Haggard. And one day she had to make a pact with him. She made a pact with him that if he left her alone, that she would be friends with him forever and never tell anybody. And like, as a little kid, and I'm a little kid listening to this, and sometimes mom will go, do you see that? Do you see that? And I'm listening to my mom and my brother, and we're holding on to mom, but mom's terrified. So we're thinking we have, there's no protection there. You know what I mean? So yeah, there's a mental... There's a lot of mental stuff going on here and kept going to church, kept going to church, kept going to church. Dad would come back. He was my hero. Like, I can't put that any other way. Dad was the man, you know, he, he's very patriarchal. Okay. He was the alpha male, the, <laughs> the, at the party, he had to be heard chest out. Um, and that's how we were taught. That's how me and my brother were taught. So we always wanted to be making him proud. We always wanted him to be proud of us. And we did sports, very athletic. I'm giving you a whole rundown here. Very athletic. My mom was my coach at the YMCA. I did soccer, baseball, basketball, football, wrestling, the whole nine. And I was a goody two shoes, my whole upbringing. And I met this guy who brought me to his house church, became friends with him. And at this house church, they believed in KJV onlyism, the King James version of the Bible. That's the real word of God. Real quick, did you know that that's the version that Mormons use, but they use the King James Version, Mormon, or sorry, King James Version, Joseph Smith translation. You know, Joseph Smith, oh, there's so many things to get into. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to derail us, but. <laughs> yeah, no, down the road, I'd love to talk with you more about your side of things. And like, really, I think it'd be some good content for your fans, especially those who are ex-Mormon. Um, yeah, like that was the word of God. Like you would have treated Joseph Smith's words. That was the word of God. And there was nothing wrong or false about it. In fact, the other scriptures were perverted. Mm -hmm. They were not accurate. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how we were told the King James Bible was. We also had, this is a big no-no, a woman pastor. <gasps> but she was into the name it, claim it, hamagashima, da, da. They spoke in tongues, the whole nine cast out demons, laying on of hands, miracles. That was the kind of church we were in. That's when I started getting serious about this Christianity. 
We've mentioned in previous conversations, and I wanted you to share with our audience about your specific church taught about literal angels and demons that were kind of tempting you to do things. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah. I mentioned that they laid on hands where we would lay on hands and pray and cast demons out of people or pray for people for healing and things like we had powers. There was power in the tongue. So if we spoke positive things, positive things would come into existence. If we spoke negative, if you if you curse, do you not know you're actually causing curses? Mm. I mean, this is how far they took. It was almost like magical thinking. Mm -hmm. And the world is a Dungeons and Dragons place. Everywhere and everything has spirits and entities, angels and demons. I remember having to burn my heavy metal CDs when I came back from, from Puerto Rico to North Carolina. I had Slipknot and Mudvayne and all this like hardcore heavy metal rock and all my hip hop and stuff because there was these spirits, these demons that literally lived in the CDs. My Pokemon cards, man, they'd be worth some money right now if I still had all of them. I burned them all because they oh, were yeah. actually the names of demons. Like it was a whole nother level of nutty everything had demons in it and pornography was the spirit the demon of lust and in fact look at alcohol they call alcohol spirits mm -hmm. so this pastor had to come to my house the lady pastor one time when my dad was in a blackout rage of alcoholism she came over to cast demons out of my dad while he was blacked out drunk and she was calling the spirit of alcohol because they're called spirits yeah you see alcohol is called spirits and it, like how far do you want to go and that's how far we would go that everything was encompassing some type of demonic force and remember the prince of this air satan is the king of the world jesus came to buy back the world but we're waiting for that second coming for him to kick satan out chain the devil, that great old dragon up and make sure the world's a better place where no more death, no more suffering, all of that. And so everywhere I went, I would imagine there's something around me. There's demons in this. I'd look at how people might act. And like me and my, my Christian buddy would be like, did you see that? Yeah. She's definitely got a demon. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. You would like start psychoanalyzing and thinking that was a spirit. Did you hear that? And we would go out at night and just run around the town and things like that and be talking like that. Interesting. How long did it take for that to kind of fade or did it? I can just imagine. I mean, we did have those sort of the Satan whispering in your ear thing, which got so much flack on my last video with Kelly. Oh, my goodness. People were up in arms with me by saying that Christianity believes in demons speaking in your ear. And what I was meaning is Mormonism. And, you know, we already made that that little caveat on the beginning that not all Christians think Mormons are Christian. Anyway, I think it's interesting, though, and your story proves it, that not all Christianity, I'm not blanket statementing, but there are groups out there that do believe in literal monsters and literal demons trying to tempt you into do bad things. How did that affect you? So first thing is, yes, like Roman Catholicism, without a doubt, have exorcist on their committees. I mean, they have trained exorcists who go and are like trained to help cast out demons or devils from people. So to argue that Christianity doesn't have that, um, they, they have to be coming from some type of Protestant type of point of view. And in fact, to know a little history about this is necessary because the Protestant Reformation, which they are protesting against the Catholic Church, their initial problems were, other than the fact that Martin Luther saw that the church was selling salvation, they were selling indulgences, and that meant like, if you want your loved one to get out of purgatory to go to heaven, pay $10, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just making up a number, and and to the church, and we'll make sure that we pray, and, the, and then she'll go out of purgatory and go into heaven, because she's in a waiting place suffering wow. right now. So people would do that. Oh, yeah. The the Protestant church, uh, or Protestants, because you've got John Calvin and various other people who were part of the the movement, they started to critically analyze the, the miracle claims, and 
like they found a lot of problems in the church's history of what really happened, demons being cast out, um, miracles happening and things. And they started saying, this doesn't make sense. This is not true. So they got so critical of miracle claims by the church that they ended up actually coming up with a solution by saying that God stopped doing miracles and all that demon stuff in the first century. And they started saying it was the word of God that was complete, that came. So we don't need miracles. We don't need all of that stuff anymore. So the church has been faking miracles since the first century with the apostles. Once the apostles all died, then those miracles stopped. That's the kind of solution they came up with. Me living with it, it was kind of weird, honestly, because I would think all the time, like, like, what what was that? I thought I saw a shadow at the corner of my eye, like going around. The, was that Satan? Was that a demon? I would like like be Whoa. worried about something at all times happening, and you're just freaking out. You just don't know what to think about in that world. It was the Protestant understanding that I started to draw to the to that kind of side because there may be some things I'm not even aware of in my relapse of back on drugs or alcohol and trying to kind of live the normal life. I call it normal because. Most of the kids in high school would go to a party and have, you know, a few drinks or smoke a, a, a joint or a bowl and then go back to their normal lives. Um, that, that wrestling between that and the world of demons and angels and stuff, at some point it faded away. I would get away from the church for a while. I'd go back to kind of this party lifestyle and experimenting with drugs or doing things. And I would like kind of get away from that angels and demons encompassing everything. And then I'd come back to Jesus and be, it'd be right back. And I had one time I took ecstasy um, in high school, at, at, like on a weekend partying. And I had been reading the Bible. I was at the part where Moses is going up to get the laws of God, the commandments, the 10 mm -hmm. words they call it in Jewish uh, theology. And I wanted to talk about it. So I took these, what were called white naked ladies, uh, ecstasy pills. And I'm sitting in my mom's jacuzzi with my brother and our buddy Devin. And I start tripping like it's, it's hitting me. I'm starting to feel the high. This stuff was strong and they're all starting to feel it. And I started wanting to talk about this exciting story about this guy named Moses going up on the mountain to talk with God <laughs> face to face. And they're like, hey, bro, don't dude. now's not the time to talk about that stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? It's good. And then they're like, bro, we, you can't talk about that stuff right now. And I was like, I can't even talk about good. And then I start hearing laughing. And then I look up and I thought I saw a shadow in the corner and it looked like, I thought I saw the face of like a demon in dark. And then all of a sudden I'm like, yo, 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 something's not right. Something's not right. And then I look over at my brother and his face transforms to a shadowy figure where I could see the teeth and the only way I could distinguish the, the facial features were the sharp teeth were, were grayish, like lighter dark. And then inside of the mouth was darker and the eye sockets were the darkest thing. And it's looking at me. And, oh. and I'm like, I'm so scared by what I saw at that moment that I just started acting like I didn't want it to know that I see it and that it sees me. And I start turning my head. And I'm like this. And then Kurt, my brother, this is what freaked me out. My brother looked at me and goes, bro, did you just see what I just saw? Oh, no. I started praying. I started speaking in tongues. I was just like, how am I going to shoot? I was just freaking out. I went inside. My wife is pregnant with my firstborn son, and I'm crying. I got out of that jacuzzi. I said, screw this. What the heck is going on? Went in there. I held my, my wife's stomach. And I just cried and she woke up, what's wrong? And I was like, I just saw a demon. And like, so this really reinforced my belief in the spiritual supernatural world. Of course it did, Derek. I bet you there's people listening right now going, well, that just proves that there's <laughs> Satan and there's demons. Like, obviously. Right. Obviously. What would you say to that now? What do you think was going on? Was it your childhood being purged through this heightened state of awareness oh well we both we all three took the same drug okay, okay? this drug I, and i taken it again after that and there was no demon of course but i was hallucinating so i without a doubt was hallucinating kurt when he said did you see what i saw 
and I didn't even talk to him about it till later. Yeah. When I went to school the next day, the, the weekend was over and I went to school, I was telling everyone, do not take drugs. Do not do drugs. Right. Like, don't do drugs. They will, it's going to kill you. Um, you know, I was trying to tell him about the spiritual realm and what I saw. And my brother was going around telling everybody, my brother's tripping. I didn't do any drugs because he's like, you're telling people we did <laughs> drugs. You can't do that. You know what I mean? But when he described what he saw, it was something radically different than oh. what I did. Um, but I put the pieces together and assumed it's the same exact thing. Yeah. And it, we all hallucinated. We all looked funny. It, it like literally distorted our perception and everything. So if you gave this drug to someone who was a Hindu who never heard of Christianity, they would have seen their mythos right. come to life through that hallucination. That's my rationalization of the situation that happened, but it solidified my belief in the supernatural for several years. I mean, just, I couldn't deny that experience. Mm -hmm. And this happens a lot. There's a, there's a lot of study on memory that I've learned since then too, because remember now I was dying of addiction. That's later in this story, but you start to learn about how we distort our memory and conflate idea to, ideas after the fact to make sense of them. And I'll give you a horrible example to make sense of this. Some people even erase their memories, not even like meaning to. Some young girls who may, may be raped, they have these visions. They think an angel visited them or whatever. And a lot of them in history have claimed to be virgins. They've never had sex with anybody but they were actually raped and didn't even know it. And they believed an angel of God visited them and that they must have been like a miraculous Mary birth, that they thought they were impregnated by an angel or a deity or God got them pregnant because they never had sex. They don't remember having sex. So trauma, traumatic fear, things like that can cause us to manipulate or naturally, not purposefully, our memory. Mm -hmm. So there's so many possibilities that can make sense of this. It doesn't necessarily mean what I saw was true. Mm -hmm. Now, a person who believes they're going to latch onto this is true just based on that story. And I'm not making any of this up. I am like really struggling between wanting to experiment, wanting to feel life and Jesus. And I'm learning stuff about that church that I once had King James version only. I found out that there's problems with what they call the textus receptus which is the textual tradition behind the King James Version, where we get our English translation. There's a lot of issues with the original words. There's missing words. They've added stuff to the text, all sorts of stuff. So I'm like, I need to get to the original Bible, the church I was originally in. They had some truth, but they weren't all right. Mm -hmm. That's the journey I start taking. My question for you is, when you started going to this specific church, were you going by yourself with your friend or did you bring mom with you or... Did your mom already know about this church? At first, I went with my friend. Eventually, my mom started going. Mm. And then it was my family. In fact, I would like to put it this way. My family was staying together, praying together, really latched onto my faith. It was me that kind of kept them wanting to do as a family, active, all together, go and be spiritual and get to oh, church wow. and all of that. Okay. But at first, mom was the only one tugging us along. Um, and by the way, they're all still in the church. They're, they still go to church. They still participate in Christianity. And it works for them, at least as far as I'm concerned. In that same no. church? Okay. This same pastor, skipping a little bit ahead, but we're going to bounce back a little to kind of give you when I became a Christian and the definitive moment. But this pastor told us that she was hearing Jesus and that Jesus told her that he was coming back before she died. Oh. She's been dead almost a decade now. Okay. So that, yeah, this is stuff to like consider as you're thinking about what the heck. Because what happens, and I want to say this as we're leading in, is what happens is what you're being told, once you start finding out something's not accurate or true, you then start to investigate and find out, well, what is? Mm -hmm. And the more you look, you have to see what else isn't. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start going, oh my goodness, is any of this true? Yeah. And it, it, it has you explore with freedom and nobody's telling you, you need to believe this. And that's where I'm at today. But I was at a 
private school. We lived in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and it's it's got some pretty rough areas where we lived. My mom didn't want me to possibly get jumped or to end up in some trouble or go down the wrong path in life. So she paid with a little bit of money my dad would make through his military career to have us go to this private school. And I remember them telling a story about this heavenly father. But first, before he told us about the heavenly father who would love us unconditionally, he said, have you ever told a lie? And they got you with a guilt trip. First thing they need you to do is know that you're guilty for bad things you've done. And those things don't go away. They're there. But they there's someone who paid for that penalty of wrongdoings, and that was Jesus. And that if you accepted him into your life, you followed him, you believe and have faith in him, the Father God, his wrath will not come down on you. He's an all-loving, all-powerful deity that will always be there to comfort you and to protect you and guide you as if you're his son. So I went down to that altar that day and I literally asked the Lord into my heart. And for the rest of that day, I was floating on a cloud. Like I had a warm spiritual experience that was so comforting. And that same feeling I had in dreams about the second coming of Jesus one of them, I'm just getting right into some shocker points here that I think are important. One of these dreams, a girl I grew up with that was right down the street was standing in a field with me and the sky literally covered in flames is coming down and I'm panicking. And as the fire's coming out toward me and I know I'm about to be engulfed in flames, I closed my eyes and just went, Jesus. And then I felt warmth. Like I thought it was the fire. And then I open my eyes and I'm in this, this dark area, but I'm warm. It reminded me of being in like a mother's womb, warm and comforting. And there's this man with a feathered pin. His head is not looking at me. And he says, Derek, whispered, everything's going to be okay. And he's writing in this book with his feathered pen. And I woke up crying. And I was like, yes, Lord. And I was getting ready for the second coming. Then there was another dream I had where I was sitting on the front porch. We like to watch the storms because there's something soothing about lightning and the clouds and the rain. And, and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden a lightning bolt struck me right in my solar plexus and just starts to suck me up into heaven. And I'm looking around and there's all of these people connected to lightning bolts floating up toward heaven. Again, that warm conversion experience I had that day in my bosom warmth of being like in your mother's belly. Uh -huh. That's how I try to describe it. It's safe. It's warm. It's comforting. That is what I felt as I was ascending up toward heaven. And I woke up crying again. That one scared me in a different way. So that same experience I have had happen to me, not only through dreams, but in real life situations throughout my entire life. And I still have it today. Now, I don't know where we're at in the story so far, but I, I want to give you a chance to kind of yeah. come in at me a little. Yeah, I want to I want to hear more about what it was like to evoke such a visceral experience. What's the atmosphere like? What's going on at the altar? What does the altar look like? How are people reacting to this? Is this something that happens a lot? It was a private Christian school and all of the students, it was K through 12. It was one of those kind of schools and all of the students are there. And I walked down to kind of like a, a uh, what do you call that, a uh, little podium. Mm -hmm. And that's where the pastor was giving the preaching. And we, I went up there and I pretty much gave my life over. They laid their hands on me and prayed and just said, repeat after me and believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Christ Jesus is Lord. And I did. And being there, knowing this father that they have painted and the guilt that I had if I did not accept I went and I accepted and everyone was there and everyone who accepted Jesus, you felt like you were on a red carpet. They put you on a throne and praise you for making this change in your life, becoming a Christian. And I had the biggest, what I would call today in a sense, placebo effect. Um, but it was real. It was amazing. It was like a high. Mm. And it was the highest high I had ever experienced in my life that I could remember consciously um, up to that day. And that high stuck with me so much that the rest of that day, 
I felt like I was floating on a cloud. So the even the teachers were proud of me. My parents were proud of me. I felt like, okay, this is it. I found home. That house church is where I kept, maintained my 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 going. It was mm-hmm. after my, I accepted Jesus that I was really active in that house church. And in that house church, we would do praise and worship music in this little living room. As soon as you walk in the door, there's a living room. And they have tambourines and little instruments to make music noise and stuff. We'd start with higher upbeat to get you going with something going. And then it would slow down and it would be almost like, yes, Lord. Um, we love you, Lord. Something like really gentle and like yeah. it, it would it would it would comfort you, but it would also make you think about what he did on that cross and how much he loves you. That he didn't even have to do this, but he thought about you. The creator of the universe thought about you and he loves you. And he wants a personal relationship with you. He wants what's best for you. This was what was going on. And my mom would be there and my brother would be there. Sometimes we'd be laying on the floor prostrate as if we're laying in the presence of God. Sometimes we would, we would, you know, be speaking in tongues, singing in tongues. That was not uncommon when a song was right, hitting the right note, getting that right feeling. We still do it today. I mean, not speaking in tongues, but like you put on the right jam, you and your (laughs) husband, I'm sure are like, you feeling that? I'm feeling that. Well, that's how we felt in church with worship yeah and we would sing and we would sometimes sing in tongues which sounds odd trust me it is but it's like you know like you're just going with whatever gibberish comes off your lips and you think you're speaking in the tongues of angels yeah that's so interesting that you brought that up because i actually on the books have a guest who his whole job in, I don't know if you've heard of Hillsong, the mega church. Yes. Before they became a mega church and they were a record label, he started working with them in the music department. And his entire job was to actually manipulate people through the music yep. to get them to feel a certain way at a certain part of the sermon. So it's interesting that you brought that up and you can recognize that it was sort of a, a musical manipulation. Um, but I mean, we all know that. We've we've watched movies. Yeah. We know how the scores work and how they make us feel what they want us to feel. But it's interesting to look at it from a religious perspective and see, hold on, do I want to be manipulated at this <laughs> point? Or because it creates these narratives that you're feeling or experiencing something that is different than just what happens through the evocation of music. It's it's supposed to, it's monopolized into making you think this is Jesus or this is the spirit or whatever it is they tell you it is. That's what you assign to it instead of understanding what's actually happening in the brain and the body and creating that feeling in you. So Continue. I'm I'm curious to know about these uh, speaking in tongues moments. Was that every Sunday? Was there special occurrences? The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, you need to, to be more orderly. You all are acting wild and doing wild things, right? But he said, I speak in tongues more than all of you, Paul would say. So we understood that speaking in tongues was like glossialia. That's the Greek word. And it's the idea of gibberish that, that, that you don't even know what you are saying. In fact, that's why you need an interpreter there. Mm. Some people would interpret that and say, and this gets later into my theology. I tried to interpret Paul because Acts chapter one has a scene where the apostles are speaking in tongues and it says like, fire rested on their on their heads and they were speaking in tongues and everyone understood the gospel in their own language so we would interpret it to mean oh well they're just speaking like spanish if you're someone who speaks english and you're speaking spanish you're speaking another tongue so they try to interpret it through that model however um this glossialia speaking in the tongues of angels men do not understand that's why there needs to be a translator there actually fits in line with other well-known Greek and pagan practices of speaking in tongues. But that gets into some historical stuff that's kind of outside of my testimony. But I think it's important to mention. So we, it was a little awkward when nobody knew about it. And I want to lead to a few things here that I think are important because speaking in tongues was one of those weird things you didn't want to introduce to somebody who didn't already know about it Mm -hmm. or wasn't already doing it. 
when I went to my high school, skipping ahead a little, and we will come back, I would bring this up with other Christians at the high school when, when I would have discussions because I was so obsessed about Jesus and this religion that I couldn't not talk about it in social settings. That's when I would have these people come to me and go, speaking in tongues, that's not gibberish. Speaking in tongues is actually another language. And I would get challenged kind of like you did when someone mm-hmm. goes, Joseph Smith looked down in a hat and he was looking yeah. at a seer stone and, and he, you know, he was mag- looking into magic and he was into weird stuff. And you're like, no, that's anti-Mormon propaganda. <laughs> I thought, well, no, you guys are in the wrong version of Christianity. I know that this is true. And they knew that theirs was true. Mm-hmm. So each person is convinced fully they're right. So how do we know who's right if both 100% believe their interpretation is the right one? Mm-hmm. This gets that's foreshadowing the future, but coming back to that home church. I gave my life to Jesus. I am fully spiritual. I am on board. And we ended up moving to Puerto Rico. Oh. We moved there for two and a half years. And we didn't have church to go to, but I was very spiritual but I had distance away from having to go to church all the time. I got big into heavy metal and hip hop and, and skateboarding and BMXing and doing all this like kid stuff and boy stuff. And I'm skipping a little bit ahead to just point out, I finally met a girl and I was in love. I was a little kid, (laughs) you know, in love was 14 years old. I lost my virginity and I felt so guilty. I felt like, man, I should have saved it and waited. And then she cheated on me. And then I was heartbroken. And I told her, since you did that, when I get back to North Carolina, because we were moving, I'm going to sleep with every girl under the sun. I just was so hurt. I was saying whatever. When in fact, the day I got back from Puerto Rico, I was kissing this girl, trying, trying to go down that path. And then I ended up dedicating my life even deeper into Jesus more than I ever had. I'm like kind of skipping some some stuff here, but while I was in Puerto Rico, I not only lost my virginity, but it's the first time I ever got drunk on alcohol. And it was me, a bunch of kids. I've had a beer as a kid, but never got drunk. Someone handed me tequila in a double shot glass. And I was 14 years old and I chugged that like fire down your uh your throat and you're like, what in the world? And then it hit me and I was reminded of that altar, Mm. that warm comfort of being in my mother's bosom, in the womb of a mother who tenderly cares for you. All my fears went away. I had no more fear, no more shame. I felt 10 feet tall. I felt strong as an ox and it did something for me. It gave me satisfaction, reminding me of that day when I accepted Jesus. Oh, wow. What was going through your mind when you moved to Puerto Rico? Because you were so invested in this church. And I want to get into the psychology of that and the beliefs that set it apart and made you feel like that was the true version of Christianity, how you feel like that was manipulating your mindset. And maybe does that lead into this alcoholic experience that we were just mentioning? (laughs) They tend to hijack your feelings and make it about Jesus or whatever it is for them. Do you feel like all of that intertwined? I know that was like six questions in one. Feel free to take a stab at whichever one you want. Yeah, I'll stab at whatever I can get my fork into. (laughs) The experience of alcohol, I think my father was alcoholic. I wonder if there's genetic involvement. Um, My environment may have played a role. But I don't know if that had any relevance to the initial, my belief in Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm making that connection because the experience I felt was similar. Mm -hmm. It gave me a high. It gave me fulfillment, meaning, purpose. In fact, if you ever go to any Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, they will talk about it like it's God. Mm -hmm. And they worshiped it. And then they have to describe this divorce or breakup with their relationship to alcohol, which was killing them to eventually find satisfaction and freedom from it. Now, the question I have in reversing everything you just said is, was my relationship with Jesus like my relationship with drugs and alcohol? I want you to ponder that as you hear my story. But in to answer your question about 
why did I believe this in the psychology involved? I would simply say it's all I knew and it was what I was told. So when you have an, a serious subjective experience, whether you think you had a vision, whether you think you had a dream, that feeling and you connect it to what people are telling you is true, it's not the person's fault. I see it with various groups and I'm not picking on anybody, but let me give you an example. If you're a Christian watching this and you believe that your belief is true, that Jesus is Lord and Savior, Son of God, He is God in the flesh, Trinity. Let's say you're not a Trinitarian. Well, there already is a split between you and the majority of Christians, but let's just let's just go with this and then say a Muslim comes along and goes, Islam is true, and Muhammad is the final prophet, and the Quran is the words of God. Your books are corrupted. And you try to understand the psychology of why did they come to that conclusion? You find out they were born into a family that way. That's what they were told. And maybe they had an experience. Their entire life experience tells them their belief is true. What makes theirs any truer than yours or yours any truer than theirs? We're attributing these beliefs that were being taught or told to the experience. That's what I think is going on. So I believed that this is true because if I didn't, I would be denying what I knew mm. I experienced and what I felt and what I knew. It would be like denying and lying to myself because that experience, I attached it to the belief. Mm -hmm. Now I look back and realize the belief had nothing, nothing to do with the experience. Mm. That's where I'm at now. So it's a very complex thing, but that's why every religious movement, whether you're in Hinduism or any religion in the world, they all have a common human experience and they all think their philosophy, their gods or God, their religion is true. Yeah. And that's something that I tend to speak about a lot, or at least it feels like I do, where I had incredible spiritual experiences when I was Mormon. And that's why my testimony was so strong. I, out of my whole family, I was the one, the valiant one, the righteous one. And <laughs> well, righteous, depending on which bishop you ask. But I, <laughs> I knew the church was true. I didn't believe it. I knew it was true because of these intense spiritual experiences, these miracles where, which is so funny in hindsight. I don't think I've told this story before. Maybe now the time where there was a time where I was so extremely sick, but the next day was drill team tryouts for high school, dance team tryouts. And it's all I wanted. I wanted it so bad. It was my first year being able to audition for this and audition my actor is showing to try <laughs> out for this. And I was so deathly sick. And so my dad wasn't home. Normally, the priesthood holder would give a blessing. Same thing, laying on of hands. I command you to be healed. And they even have consecrated oil that they put on your head. So I think that gets overlooked a lot. But Mormonism definitely has this whole healer thing going on with the the worthy priesthood holders and then when the blessing doesn't work it's either because the person who got the blessing didn't have enough faith or the priesthood holder wasn't worthy that's a whole another can of worms anyway my dad was not home for whatever reason and so my mom decided to give me a blessing kind of in proxy to my dad which kudos to mom because no one ever does that at least to my knowledge it's kind of a no-no for a woman to pretend to have the power of god or the power of the priesthood but nonetheless she gives me a blessing and the next day i felt a million times better went to tryouts made the team the whole thing so it's those type of scenarios where I go, clearly the church is true because God worked through my mother, which looking back, that shouldn't really have been a faith strengthening exercise because mom never should have had the power of the priesthood. <laughs> but, but I made it make sense and it worked. I could have just gotten a really good sleep that night and just felt better. You know, there's so many other logical mm -hmm. reasons for that. But my point is I had so many spiritual experiences that confirmed my faith of the church. And once I found out that the church was a scam and that it had been lying to me and that its history was insane and I didn't want any part of it, I really had to consider those experiences and go, well, wait, 
what about that? I can't deny right. that I had this powerful experience. And that's when I started looking at it from a new lens. And that's why I always tell people, I don't doubt that you had an incredible experience, but do you think it's possible that you had a spiritual experience that had absolutely nothing to do with that religion you're part of or that group that you're a part of? Do you think it's possible that you had a visceral experience with a higher power if you want to still believe in that yeah. or maybe there was something chemical going on in your brain maybe i don't know i don't know of the answers but i do know that oftentimes we like to assign meaning based on the perspective and the reality that we're living in based on our experiences the people around us what people are telling us as you mentioned and it's easy to get caught up in that and not look at it from an outsider's perspective and just allow it to be what it is, a beautiful experience. That's what <laughs> I'm looking forward to your new perspectives on those spiritual experiences. But first, <laughs> mm -hmm. but first, continuing on with your story and doubling down with the Jesus beliefs okay. and how if it was that one church that kind of set you on that trajectory of being a follower and what those belief systems, the purity culture, how that impacted your life moving forward. Great, great point, because that's what I was thinking about while we were talking about this, I was thinking, okay, I need to touch on my sexuality as a, as a normal, natural primate human. Uh, I am I am earth stuff, okay? <laughs> I am normal, this is what this world yeah. is, right? But I'm being told that this flesh is wicked and bad and that this world will pass away and that you know you want to go to heaven you need to get out of this body this is corruptible and i'd be reading the paul pauline letters because i was devout i actually would read my bible and go paul's saying stuff about the flesh and the struggle and 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 can't keep the law and all these things so i told you about my girlfriend that i lost my virginity to and i come back from puerto rico in north carolina and i start committing myself to jesus but before that, this is very TMI material, but I have to be authentic and transparent because someone out there, I'd rather look like a fool or have people mock me and try to, you know, whatever. There's some uh, some trolls on the internet, whatever, but there's going to be someone who's watching this that is going to relate because this is really, I think, the case for most humans. And I can't see behind your closed walls and your doors, but. I hit puberty while I was in Puerto Rico or started to, I watched pornography mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed the, the sensation that came with that, the, um, something about sex that really drew me in and attracted me. And I would have that kind of almost private communion with myself through the experience, um, in pornography. And so like everything kind of comes down and boils down to experience, but I would get that natural drive and interest and motivated to go and, and, and look at pornography. And of course, young boys masturbate. It's normal. Mm -hmm. So sorry if this is TMI, but it's necessary because I think we shame this stuff and hide this stuff and don't want to just speak openly. So I go back to North Carolina and I am trying to go full Jesus mode. I am ready to like commit myself. I don't want to go and see these other girls that I told my girlfriend in anger I was going to do all this stuff. I wanted to do the right thing. And I knew what the right thing was, is give my life to Jesus fully and commit to being his son, his child, and, and following his ways and stuff. Um, and I did that. I got so serious. I'm in school. I'm reading my Bible. And I'd have these moments where I would backslide and go to bonfires or I was like the guy who invited everybody to bonfires and we would get drunk and I would smoke weed for the first time, howling at the moon, mm -hmm. imagining how much fun that was, the experience was and stuff. And then there were girls and then Jesus. And whenever I would get off track for a while, I'd come back to Jesus and I would go between my addictions, which weren't addictions at the time. They were just me having fun as a kid doing things, skipping class to go smoke or whatever it was. Uh, I went through a phase of all these girlfriends. They weren't even really girlfriends. They were like, no strings attached, having fun. Then back to Jesus. And I would be really into Jesus. And um, down the road, I meet my wife who I thought was just going to be like a hookup. And I'm working extra overtime to try and get with her. 
she ain't having it. She's <laughs> like, you better back off because I'm not doing that. And I'm like, come on, I'm doing everything. Like uh, these card tricks have been working on all the other girls. How come <laughs> it's not working on this one? By the time that I was fortunate enough to make love to her, I was in love and I got her pregnant and I'm a Christian. And so this means man up, marry, become mm. the provider, father, the whole nine. I'm in high school. Mm. She isn't even legally able to make her own decisions. I'm 17 turning 18. She's 16. Mm. Her mom signed her over to me and I had custody of her and I'm her husband. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. This is some like, we should have been on 16 and pregnant MTV. Where were you when we <laughs> needed you? You know what I'm saying? Back to Jesus. I'm felling in my 11th grade, going into 12th grade. I think I'm senior this at this point. I'm felling the first half. And while I was in class, I'd be off like my Bible's my phone here. And I'd be off and I'd be like reading my Bible while they're in like calculus. And I'm sitting here going like this. And then the teacher would go, stop reading your Bible, Derek. And I'd be like, oh, I'm not, but I am. And when I'd get in trouble for being late to class, and that would happen from time to time and I had in-school suspension, guess what I was reading? My Bible. And I remember it like I can close my eyes and I go there and I see God forming Adam from the dirt and Eve from his rib. And then they are getting kicked out of the garden with a cherubim, with a sword of fire saying, get out. You cannot eat of the tree of life. Um, they're not allowed to live forever. And then it goes all the way down to Moses going up on the mountain to get the laws of God. I mean, I'm skipping ahead all the narrative. I read this throughout high school and I read the whole Bible in the King James Version life strikes, but I'm getting more serious about wanting to understand what's true because at this time in my life, several voices are telling me several different things about this book. And I want to be accurate. And I would pray and I'd ask God, God, show me the truth. Tell me what the accurate understanding is. I ask like King Solomon, give me wisdom. And then that night he sacrificed a thousand cattle on one of the high places and God visited him in the dream and said, what do you want? Ask of me and I'll give it to you. And he doesn't ask for riches. He doesn't ask for the death of his enemies. He just asks for wisdom. And God mm -hmm. said, because you asked for wisdom, you'll get everything else and wisdom. So I'm over here desperate to want to know the truth. I am obsessed in wanting to be accurate. I have a question. I need to pop in here because... I would say that from my perspective, and a lot of people listening, they're probably going, well, it sounds like the Bible saved your life if you're in this cycle of what they would see as destructive behavior, and then you turn to Jesus, and you're reading the Bible in high school. Do you feel like it was a good thing in your life, and are you glad that you had that to turn to at the time? Yes. Without a doubt. Yes. People do it with the Quran. People do it with the Bible. People do it, if you're a Jew, with the, with the Torah. Um, Hindus do it with the Vedic traditions. Buddhists find out that they have Buddhist traditions they read, they turn to. People have different stories, traditions, mythos that they might go to, and it works for them. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was thinking about your experience when your mother came and did what she did and laid her hands on you, and you went, and the next day you were like, wow, that was real, that happened. There is this thing called the placebo effect. Yeah. And I'm not saying that that's... I'm not, look, I, I can't go back and observe and test and know that that's what happened, but it wouldn't be shocking to me if there is a sense of a placebo effect that we gain from these traditions that we, mm. we glean into. However, while I love the stories, I still love the Bible today, even though I poke holes in it and I do all sorts of really critical stuff and look at it from a historical critical angle. I want to know the facts on the ground. I want to know the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, there's a part of me that had so much guilt all the time because of what it puts on you. Okay. The, 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 the whole mythos that comes with it about, look, Jesus died for you. How dare you not live for him? How dare you slip up and go and look at the pornography or sleep with a girl? Or how dare you? There's a guilt in your behavior about how you act. And if that doesn't line up with uh, Christ or whatever, if your particular behavior doesn't match up with it, well, am I a reprobate? 
Am I really God's child? Does his spirit really live in me? And knowing whether or not I'm, I have this heavenly parent or not all the time really kind of boils down to also my father making my dad proud and wondering if there's some psychological connection between how I'm going to impress and, and make my father proud and do what I'm supposed to, to keep our name without shame mm -hmm. and this heavenly father. So it's not just that because I know many Christians who didn't have daddy issues and problems with their dad. Um, but there's a guilt that is always over your head about what you're doing and how you're doing it, whether it's right or wrong. And that guilt, I think, can be very mentally harmful. Yeah. Especially if you're just going through puberty and you're literally expressing yourself the way that comes completely normal and natural. If, right. if the internet didn't exist, if Playboy magazines did not exist, I would have had the images in my head. I would have remembered a girl or something, right? Guys would have done this. And I'm speaking to you, to a girl. So I know that, I don't know, I can't speak for you. I can speak for me. And <laughs> it's normal though. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't look at it that way. I thought this was bad. Yeah, no, it's 100% normal. In fact, I did two whole episodes on this with a sex therapist who was Mormon and excommunicated for teaching wow. the truth about masturbation because it didn't align with the church's teachings on it being a sin and wrong and whatever. But the Bible, I do want to get to the point where you come at it from a historically accurate point of view and then realize, wait a second, I don't know about any of this, kind of like I did with Mormonism doing some research. And I'm like, wait a second, I don't know about any of this. Yep. <laughs> I go between de denomination and move on to no other denominations. I went to Calvary Chapel. Uh, at the Calvary Chapel, there was a pastor who was misquoting scripture, but he wasn't purposely doing it. He was just preaching. Mm -hmm. And I was reading like I knew the Bible, right? I've read these things over and over. And he was saying stuff and I was going, that's not accurate. That's not what it says there in English. I didn't know Greek or anything, but I'm, I'm like, hold on, man. Maybe my calling's to teach. I go to the pastor. I said, how do I become a pastor like you? Maybe that's my calling. Hey, go to this local college. I went to the college. I'm like going to become a pastor because I want to help kids. I want to help the world. I want to preach God's truth, his word. Mm -hmm. While I'm at the college, other students there have different theology than I do. And I became what are called a Calvinist at this time. The re pretty much John Calvin is one of the Protestants that I was mentioning, but he also was trying to go back to an older tradition of a church father named Augustine. And really what it's about is predestination. In the New Testament, Paul talks about God planning and doing things like he had already predestined things to happen. And we really have no say in what happens. And so I'm trying to paint it in a way that's simple for layman's terms, but in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter nine, he describes it saying, before Jacob and Esau were even born, so that God's purpose of election would stand, he said, the older shall serve the younger. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So God chose Jacob, but he hated Esau. And I looked at that and went, God loves everyone. I was taught that God loves everyone. Mm. He can't hate people. But several places in the Bible, it says that God hates people. He hated Esau. Psalms 5.5 5 says that God hates the workers of iniquity. He hates not just their iniquity. He hates the workers of iniquity. That's why people are thrown in hell. So it started making sense to me. Well, the only people you're going to burn are people you hate. You wouldn't do that if you love them. Yeah. I was trying to make sense of my worldview. Like it never made sense. God loves people. He'll cook them forever. That how I couldn't make sense of it. Well, I couldn't swallow that pill either. After a while, I realized, you mean to tell me some of my loved ones who'd not taken Jesus seriously, I love them more than God? And he goes deep. I go through this college and I relapsed again. I had my wisdom teeth pulled. They put me on opiates. Off to the races I go for another year or whatever on opiates. And then I get clean again, back on Jesus. But as around this time, I start to investigate eschatology, which is the study of last things. I mentioned this before to you that Jesus said some stuff in the gospels about when some things were gonna happen, the end of history, 
the end of the world, that kind of thing, that they were going to happen in his lifetime. The majority of all Christianity agrees that Jesus is going to change the world in the future. They're waiting for the world to be changed. I wanted Jesus to be right because I believed in him. My experience told me so. And he said that this stuff was going to happen back then. He's not a liar. So it had to have happened back then, but it had to happen in a way that we just missed it. Mm. And that is called full preterism. It's, it's a whole different group. Well, I got in big trouble. I got in real big trouble for believing in this position. And my Presbyterian PCA Calvinist church, they would visit our house if we weren't there on a Sunday and knock on our door and say, why weren't you here on the Sabbath, which is actually a Saturday. They called Sunday Sabbath. Mm -hmm. They were like that serious. And they were like, why didn't you show up? Which is very cult mentality to show up to people's houses and wonder why they're not at church. Well, I get in trouble and they call me in one day after church to have five elders in the church sit down. It felt like a court and I was sitting at the seat and they told me not to speak, but remain silent. And they were rebuking me, all five of them correcting me for the heresy of full preterism, the teaching that Jesus came back in 70 AD with the temple's destruction in the first century that that is a heresy and you should not be teaching it. You need to change and get back in line with the true teachings of Jesus and the New Testament. Oh, wow. They would not let me speak. Yeah. They actually have that in Mormonism, the excommunication, the trial where you go in with, with all these different men sitting there and telling you, you did all these things wrong. What do you have to say for yourself? Although they do let you speak for like 20 minutes. <laughs> and then, but they already pretty much know what they're going to say, which is, well, you're excommunicated anyway. See you in a year. It's crazy because I felt so attacked, like how you felt when the bishop was mm -hmm. correcting you and rebuking you. I felt so uncomfortable yeah. that I realized this wasn't my home. I needed to find my home. I thought that it was my home, but it wasn't. So I left and I relapsed again. And I relapsed on opiates. And I'm going to skip ahead and just say, when I finally was excommunicated and I stopped putting myself in a, a, an organizational religion, like a particular church, I had the freedom to explore things that I never did. Mm. And I started understanding there's a way to understand, while I was a full preterist, different interpretations of things. Can I give you one example? Yes, please. Do you know the story of Samson, the strongest man who ever lived? No, but I would love it if you told me. So Samson had seven locks of hair. He was an Israelite who had a thing for Philistine women. Long story short, he ends up in love with this Philistine woman named Delilah. If you ever hear someone call you Delilah, just know they're trying to be derogative. Oh. Um, Delilah was trying for the Philistine men to find out the weakness of Samson because Samson was like invincible. He was the strongest man who ever lived. His seven locks of hair get cut off finally by the third try. And when she, when she found out his weakness was if you cut his hair, he'll lose his strength. They cut his hair. They gouge his eyeballs out oh. of his head with, with hot irons. Oh. And then he's grinding milk. Oh, yeah. The story's pretty gruesome. But I won't, I won't get you into all the details. But if you take that literal, you can read that literal. There was another way to understand it, though. Samson, the word in Hebrew is little son. And so I started realizing, oh my gosh, I found a teaching by a Freemason actually, oh. um, who, who went to explain that Samson means the sun and his seven locks of hair are the rays, the, the, the rays of the sun. And if you cut the light of the sun off, darkness, the sun loses its strength. And so Delilah in the story gets paid in silver. Silver is a symbol for the moon. And the sun and the moon have a love-hate kind of relationship. Throughout all mythology, you'll find that the, the moon is usually the female and the sun is usually the male, and they have a love-hate relationship. Well, I found this interpretation to be quite convincing because in the story, one of the places, Samson ties a fox's tails together and puts it in the field, and it scorches the entire field. Take that literal if you want, but we know that a hot summer sun can literally catch fire fields in the summertime. And so I'm starting to realize maybe there's symbolism in the Bible and not everything's literal. That led me down 
a path that really helped me land my airplane of deconverting because I realized what's the truth? Mm -hmm. There's so many different views and so many positions on this. How do I know what the truth is from the Bible? And from my dying from addiction and heroin, I wanted to understand what was wrong with me. I thought I was insane. I kept going back and forth, back and forth between addiction to uh, drugs or alcohol, and then back on Jesus or back in the gym wanting to do testosterone to get you know my pump on and stuff and be all big and strong. I, I thought I was nuts. I didn't know what was wrong with me. The church told me I had a spiritual problem that you need to get right with God or it's demons or devils or you need this or that. But the other side said, this is a disease and that there is a solution to you, but you have some, there, there are problems. Your frontal lobal cortex and your midbrain are not shooting the neurons properly. The signals aren't right. Your behavior, the kind of patterns you've lived your life in aren't right. There are so many things. I don't even know how to get this story fully out to you without exhausting these things. <laughs> I ended up stealing for my addiction and got a felony charge. I had stolen from my parents. I gave a testimony on YouTube 10, 12 years ago when I got clean one of the times and I was telling a church how I was saved and how I was this bad guy, but God saved me and it was only Jesus Christ, the whole nine, um, on and on and on. Now I started seeing, wow, I wasn't, I found myself. Like I, I finally found myself and it was me the whole time. Almost like, do you remember Interstellar? Did you mm -hmm. ever watch that movie with Matthew McConaughey? Mm -hmm. You remember when they go through the wormhole and there's somebody touching them and then and then at the end, his daughter's talking to the ghost and, yeah. and it was him the whole time? Yeah. That's how I feel my story was. At the end, when I realized this was all a phantom, a mirage, I thought this was true it was you, Derek. It was you all along. You had what it took. It was the loved ones around you that helped you to overcome addiction. Yeah. And I kept putting the pin the tail on the donkey, the right Christianity. Not one of these is true because I had that real experience. Yeah. I'll let you feel free to comment. I mean, there's so many things there's here. There's so much to touch on. I mean, I was actually getting a little choked up, Derek. Uh, because it really is beautiful when, and I don't mean to say that one way is right and one way is wrong. If praying to Jesus makes you feel safe and loved and happy, please do that. I just want to comment on your story and how with this full circle, you were able to find that within yourself, that power within you. That is so beautiful. And I just, I just love your story and the fact that you were able to ground yourself in pragmatism while also not throwing out those spiritual experiences is a really beautiful thing. So I would love to hear your opinion now, since I promised the listeners how you feel looking back at that experience, accepting Jesus and God, how you are able to see that now through a different perspective. So this, this is where I'm at today. I think I'm a naturalist and I understand that there are spiritualists out there that might think, oh, he's discounting the spiritual world. Um, I, I probably would rationalize many of the experiences and describe them as psychological or some type of chemicals that may have played a significant role. That doesn't mean I am trying to um, push them down to purely just chemicals bubbling in my brain, yeah. there's much more meaning to it all to me than, than that. I understand if we put it in a test tube, that's my, that might be what we saw. But what I experienced from it in my own little esoteric way is like this. I've always loved my mom and my dad. Um, some people may not have the same experience with their mother or their father. They may not have that kind of relationship, but they have always, even through thick and thin, been my heroes. And it's recent science that I've been studying that's led me down this path of thinking, why do we believe in gods? Why are we yearning for heavenly father? Why are some religions having heavenly mother? In fact, if you go into ancient Israelite religion, you know, the one where your Bible comes from, they did have a goddess, a mother God, mm. and she was married to father God and her name was Asherah. 
And she's a long forgotten goddess that I love to talk about on my channel because she brings a whole nother angle to the whole dynamics of God and heaven and all. Um, but for me, I look at it like this. We're in our mother's womb for nine months, give or take. And everything that we need is in that comfort zone that I felt when I went down to the altar, that I felt when I took that double shot of, of vodka, that I felt when I ingested the chemicals that I may have taken throughout the years, that shot of heroin. When I was getting clean off heroin, someone wrote in the newspaper around that time that it's like God comes down from heaven. These are their words almost verbatim. This is what they said. It's like God comes down from heaven, wraps his arms around you and says, everything's going to be okay. And it's the same thing that I had in that dream. Mm -hmm. Derek, everything is going to be okay. That experience in our mother, our mothers, in my perception, are our God. And we, when we're finally out of the womb, we're crying. We're dependent on them. We assume that they are there. We already believe they exist. Even if they're not around, we cry for them. And they hear our cry and they come. And I can tell you over and over through biblical language and throughout religious ideas throughout the world, the relationship between the devotee and the God or the goddess is like that of a child to the mother or father. And I'm saying, I think the religions of the world are a natural leap. They're a natural leap between the real serious relationships that are real between us and our experience with our mothers and our fathers that's what I think is the real thing. I think what we do is we pin the tail on the donkey to our preferred flavor. Oh, you like Nikes? Well, I like Adidas. Oh, you like Adidas? Well, I like this brand. And the religion becomes kind of a brand. But at the end of the day, I think what's really the fruit of the, the basis, the foundation is that neurological connection between the mother and the father. And that is how I now perceive this. So, I don't knock it. I understand that this is why I think people believe. And I get that some people need that for psychological, I guess, comfort. protection, foundation, comfort. Yeah. But that's where I see it all. I, I see it now in the natural way. I think that's where gods come from. And notice in all these texts, an ancient philosopher from Greece once said, his name was Xenophon. He said, if horses could draw images of their gods, they would have the heads of horses. Mm. And if, if dogs could draw the heads or the pictures of their gods, they would look like dogs. The gods always reflect the image of the perceiver because we are the reflection of them or, or we make them the reflection of us, even though our story says we're made in their image. I was just going to say, what about that scripture? Look at me knowing a scripture. Yeah. I was like, hold on. I thought <laughs> that's so interesting. And it's something that I definitely want to think on. In most religions, aren't we supposed to be actual children of the creator? So it would make sense to have that sort of dynamic. And so for you, when you had that spiritual experience, when you were accepting the father, you believe that you were accepting a protector into your life or another version of your own physical father? I think so. And that's 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 after the fact. Now that I look yeah. back and rationalize that experience, I think that what really glued me to it was this father was, they painted it better, unimaginably better than your earthly father and will never forsake you and will be there everywhere you go. He will be there with you. Now that was very comforting. I also want to say that is where I think there's also the damage because your father's watching you turn it on to the, to the pornography. Yeah. Your father's watching you do the drugs. You can't live life um, without your father is there with you. Don't let him down. And if you really believe that and you're living that, that can be very obsessively uh, kind of like the demons thing. They're everywhere. Psychologically, that does some things to you. And, um, but I do think that's what attracted me ultimately was this father was kind of the replica of my earthly one. Mm -hmm. Wow. The, your story is wild and I really appreciate you sharing it. And I'm wondering just to close this out here, 
what was it that made you feel so inspired to do what you do now and to dive deeper into the history and the Bible and debunking mythology? It's so interesting over there on your channel. I love this stuff. <laughs> I love the Bible. I love the religious text. I love learning the history. I love the good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, look, you've watched Game of Thrones, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. How? Let's be honest here. We're not saying we would act like they act, but how um, exciting or kind of wild is it to find out that, you know, the Lannisters are incestual? And you're like, whoa, <laughs> like, talk about drama, right? Now, I'm not saying anyone should act on that, but there's something climatic about the, the, the weird dynamics of crazy human interactions and, and something gory. The Bible is like the Game of Thrones. I'm not making this up. Yeah. Yes, there aren't dragons, but yes, there are. <laughs> Leviathan was a fire-breathing dragon found in the book of Job. Literally breathes fire from its mouth. So if you found Game of Thrones interesting, wait till you find out about King David and King Saul. And King David had this really weird relationship with Jonathan. Just to give you an example, I'm trying to get the excitement going here because to give you an example, Jonathan, the son of King Saul, was very, very close in relationship with David. It said he loved him more than any woman. Oh. That's kind of odd. It says that they kissed on the lips. They made a covenant in nude together. And several academics that I've talked to say Jonathan and David might have had a romantic relationship. These are biblical heroic figures. King David, it's through his seed that Jesus comes on the scene. Okay. When you start to put these things into perspective, it'll really intrigue you, especially when you don't have the dogma that we had with our church telling us how to read these things and how this is so true. And this is no, 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 no. The stories, the history, the good, the bad, the ugly. I do the same thing with Islam, same thing when I'm investigating the Hebrew Bible as I do with the New Testament. And I can't wait to dive into more of the Greek myths, the Indian mythologies, to go into other myths and other cults. So I don't know. I'm, I'm really into this stuff. And I want people to have a secular approach to being able to learn without anyone telling them, drop your money in this hat or, or else, or you need to believe like me and think like me. Yeah. No, come as you are, think what you want, leave as you want. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I love it. I would love to see you do something on the Hindu gods and goddesses because I love me some Lakshmi. I mean, the <laughs> goddess of abundance, I'm all for it. <laughs> right? Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. This was a fantastic episode. There is so much information in there, and I appreciate you sharing your experience. Everyone go to Myth Vision. Uh, what's your actual handle, YouTube handle? Is it Myth Vision? Yeah. Uh, I think it's Myth Vision Podcast, but either way. Myth Vision Podcast. And do you want to drop any uh, social media links? I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I have a website. I have a course website. Um, I can send you a, a link tree if you want, and then they can they can click there if they want. Perfect. But, uh, I mean, mostly check out YouTube. Yeah. Okay, cool. We'll link all that in the description below. Uh, before we go, I almost forgot our Linda Listen moment, sassy statement to an organization or someone who's pissed you off or inspiration to our listeners here. L L Linda, L L Linda, listen, Linda, <laughs> listen. Be yourself and don't tell, don't let other people tell you what to think. Free yourself because you are the most beautiful thing this world has to offer. You are the greatest thing this world has to offer. And you, you alone have the capability to make a new world. My father once said, son, you only have to change one thing in this world. And I said, what's that? He said, you. And another way of putting it, he said, everything because you are everything. Wow, I love it. That was beautiful, thank you. Well, unless you have any other final thoughts before we go, we can sign off. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. There's, there's so much I felt like I had to get through so that we weren't here forever. <laughs> well, there's definitely a lot to dive into, but 
I think this was a great intro at the very least. So thank you again for sharing. And for all of our listeners, if you would like to support the podcast, that would mean a lot to me. We are starting to do little chats and exclusive news on my Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. Taylor, thank you so much for joining. I appreciate you. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with our visibility. You can also find me on social media at cults to consciousness or reach out by email at cults to consciousness at gmail.com.